let me let me just start by saying that um, I'm here wearing two caps. It was last night that I was asked to say a few words here to represent our candidate, Ashiwa Jubola Ahmed Tinumbu. But I had already planned to come here in my own personal capacity. So I'm speaking with two hats here. But let me start with a goodwill message from our candidate and also to launch from him. Then I'll say a few things on my own behalf. First of all, our candidate extends his tremendous respect to the author and to the subject matter of this book. It's a great book, long overdue, and it'll be very revealing to the Nigerian people precisely what the contents are. And we have always had respect for Mojid. He's somebody of immense integrity. He's somebody that people can relate to, and he's somebody that Ashiwaju has tremendous, tremendous respect for. Unlike most, he always seeks the other side of the story. And that's what makes him so special. So we are fully behind him in this. Ashiwaju and his entire team, and there are others here as well, very senior members of the campaign organization are here. Um, and we're very proud of his effort as a Nigerian to come up with this great work. And the way in which he did it also speaks volumes about what a good journalist he really is. And it's our pleasure to launch this book. I will not specify the amount, but the candidate has asked me to say that we will launch it with a very handsome amount of money and we will collect 10 copies to take back today. So that's that aspect and that's the message from Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinumbu. Now, on a personal note, let me say this. I'd just like to quickly speak as somebody that was working and still is one of the most loyal people and people that just revere President Olusha Gombasanjo. Like if I could said earlier, I had the privilege of working under him as a spokesman and also as a minister. And there's nothing that has been said here that the bishop said or that has been revealed in this book about the content of his character that surprises me. And anybody that thinks that President Obasanjo looks stupid, as somebody has suggested, or he himself has suggested uh, to Chidoka and others in the past, has to be pretty stupid themselves. All you have to do is look into his eyes when he's speaking, and you'll know the depth of this man. He's extremely intelligent, very discerning, very sharp, very firm, very, very tough. And most importantly, he's very patriotic. He loves this country with a passion. And I'll give you three examples of that very briefly. The first one was when he came in and I first started interacting with him. He was so hostile to the idea of the OPC and Yoruba secession. And many of us were alarmed because we felt that, look, after what he had been through, that surely he would understand the aspirations of some in the Southwest that wanted to break off from the country. President Obas Onjo asked Aki Oshutoku and I, we had not joined government at this time. On one occasion, he said we should leave the villa, leave his sitting room, because he would not hear any talk of OPC or any talk of secession or the rights of the Southwest. He was very, very firm. And I've never forgotten that experience. That is the measure of his love for Nigeria, even though he had been through what he went through in the hands of the military administration that had locked him up and framed him up. So that was the first one. The second one was when I was minister and um, the German ambassador came to the office. There were some issues, some aviation issues. And we had decided to be very hard on the Germans and the French and some others. So we grounded them. We wouldn't let them fly to Lagos. They were being unfair to us. And um, the German ambassador was very rude to me. He was rude to me in front of my staff and the media and everything. We still have the recording, trying to tell us how to run our affairs in the country. And of course, I would have none of that. And I asked him to, either he would leave or I would leave. And I really told him off. The minute I finished and I walked out on him with my whole team, I knew that this was trouble. So I immediately put a, put a, a call through to the villa to report myself, so to say, to try to reach the president. And I reached him on the phone. I said, sir, they're going to report me because I've just been very rude to the German ambassador and I'm going to write a letter to his foreign minister or I'll ask our own foreign minister to write. 
he had no right to he said, Baba asked me what happened and I told him and what he said to me was well we will accept anything you do as long as it's in the interest of Nigeria I'm fully behind you don't worry he didn't stop there at the next council meeting cabinet meeting he issued a directive I'll never forget that day he didn't mention the incident but he issued a directive to all the ministers that we will not allow ambassadors from other countries to interfere in our affairs here so all of you please stand firm don't let them interfere and carry on your work that's when I realized that there is no way unlike most leaders and I have to say this in this country this man will never compromise on the integrity of this country he will never back down and he will never allow any foreign power or any foreign person to tell us what to do so I'm not surprised what is in those letters one last example and this is a very interesting one. I was assigned to be the person, the minister, to be with um, uh, the late Muammar Gaddafi uh, when he came to Nigeria. It was the summit of African heads of state and South American heads of state. And of course, Gaddafi came in great fanfare. I was quite shocked. It was an honor for me to be asked to be, to be with him. You know, So I waited for him at the airport. We were all waiting, and people were coming in. And when he arrived, he came in two planes. There were about 200 people on the ground already from Libya, all his security team. It was very intimidating. But when the great leader now came down, we got in the car to leave the airport to go to town. And we were stopped at the gate. And, you know, I was so embarrassed. The security people did not let us go past. We went back. I apologized to him. We went into the hall. And of course, you know, he, he, he speaks English, but he hardly spoke it. He didn't speak it on that day. It was a very embarrassing situation. I put calls through to my boss in the villa, uh, General Abdullah Mohammed. I don't know what's going on. They said, well, you know, he has to, the arms that they're bringing in through the boots of their various cars. They had about 200 cars of their own, which they had floated, that they have to be dropped off at the airport. Otherwise, we won't let them in. So I found myself in a very difficult situation. After a while, they came and said, okay, it's time for us to go. We can now go in. With all, these, uh, with all these bodyguards and everything. We got into the car for the second time. We got to the gate for the second time. They blocked us for the second time. At this point, Gaddafi got out of the car. He walked from where the car was and said he's going to walk all the way into Abuja in the sun. And everybody else, all his bodyguards, the drivers, they all got out. And there we were, and of course I had to go with him. We were walking down the road. And I was thinking to myself, what happens if this man, you know, he, he was an elderly man, it was high, the sun was like, what happens if something happens, he drops dead? I mean, we can't walk all the way to, to Abuja. It was a, a terrible situation for me. So again, I called, I reached the chief, I said, look, don't worry. I said, we're walking to Abuja, we're, we're right here in the streets. And the man said he's going to walk, that if they won't let the cars in, we'll walk. So the chief of staff said, look, don't worry, that the president is on his way to the airport and uh, he will resolve the issue. That's what saved the day. And I whispered to Gaddafi, I said, look, sir, your brother is coming here to resolve this issue right now. So please don't, let's not walk any further. He's, he said, coming? I said, he's coming right now. He's on his way to come and solve this problem. So he said, okay, that's how he went back into the, into the waiting room. When we got back to the waiting room, within 15 minutes, the president arrived with great fanfare. And he came straight to see Gaddafi, greeted him, you know, very, very, as if nothing had happened. That's what struck me. And then Mr. President now said he's going to Lagos to do something. He's coming back later in the day. And then Gaddafi now told him there were some issues. Mr. President said, don't worry, it will be resolved. And he was leaving. As he was leaving, I went after him. I said, sir, what are we going to do about this? You know what Baba said to me? He said, they must drop those arms. They're not going to allow them to take them. <laughs> Oh my God. So I realized we still had a problem. So I went back. I told, they said, okay, third time, let's try. Do you know they stopped us one more time after that? And until those arms were removed from the boots of those cars, we were not allowed in. It was after the arms were removed, that's when we were allowed uh, to come into town. And that's the measure of the CNC that we had in those days. It was an honor and a privilege to serve under you, sir. And let me tell you, Nigeria still hasn't done justice to what you have done for this country over the years. I dare say it here and now, 
The best cabinet that we ever had in this country was the cabinet that you formed in 2003 up until 2007. You gave us leadership, you gave us courage, you gave us strength. And you allowed us to disagree with you in cabinet meetings, and that was the greatest lesson of all. So I congratulate you, I congratulate Mojit for this wonderful book, and may God guide us and lead us all. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.